Hey y'all, welcome back to Purposeful Marketing. Marketing with a purpose for the everyday practitioner. Uh, Aaron Weeks is on vacation and he thinks that spending time with his friends and family and his dog is more important than the podcast. So he is actually not here uh, this episode. It is just Mary and I, and we are talking about goals. Um, how to set them? Should you set them? What types of goals are effective? Um, maybe we'll touch on all of that. Maybe we won't. We'll see. I kind of had a like entry question to pass to Mary in terms of, you know, I feel like goal setting is something that people above you in the food chain are always t telling you about. Um, like people are, a lot of times people can be more interested in the goals that you set for yourself than, um, than those goals happen to like actually affect change in, in how you work. Um, I guess so a good starter question is, you know, has goal setting been effective in your marketing career? Um, what goals have helped you? What goals haven't? Yeah, I am kind of with you, James. Like, I think goals are this thing that leadership asks of you or tells you is really important. But personally, I have never really set goals. It's just like, it's more like I just decide to do something. So if I want to, for example, learn how Google ads works, I just learned how it works. I didn't need to tell myself, hey, by this day, by this time, I want to learn um, these four features of Google ads. You know, I know everyone talks about smart goals. Um, I think that if you need motivation and you need those check marks to get things done, then it's really important. But I, I'm just like a very internally motivated person. So once I decide to do something, I just do it. So yeah, goals personally have not been as effective. Now I will say now that we're in an agency, you know, performance and adding value to our clients is extremely important. So goals from a client perspective and setting them for, you know, week over week, month over month, quarter over quarter, and then year over year is really important. Like it um, kinds of kind of sets a stake in the ground for measurement and improvement. So personally, I don't use goals professionally. I use them very frequently. Yeah, I think that makes a ton of sense. I mean, I think every time I've tried to use like a personal goal, say, um, like a good example would be, I actually quit all of my jobs at one point, um, to write a book. Um, and the goal was to write it and actually take the time to edit it because I am not a finisher of projects. Um, I am a beginner of many projects and a finisher of none. Um, and you know, the goal, it was a failed goal. Uh, I did not do the thing. I did the exact thing I wanted to avoid doing, which was I wrote the first draft and then I wrote another first draft of something entirely different because I didn't like what I had done in the first place. And I think, um, there's an amount that like a personal life goal, like it, if it doesn't align with like everything you want to do, if it doesn't align with your value system, if it, if it just isn't a fit, like you're, you're not going to, I, I don't have the capability to upturn or uproot who I am to succeed at some sort of personal goal. I think I'm just too flimsy in that way. I am, but because I am not, I don't know if I'm internally motivated or not. I think I, uh, I think I'm not internally motivated, but I do enjoy like getting things done and doing them well. So goal setting professionally is pretty much necessary for me to like get the right things done. Um, and I do remember smart goals. Like when I first like heard that I was actually sell that was when I was selling door to door. Um, and 
I liked it. I mean, I had never heard it before. I, I, I couldn't believe that here I was at like 23, having never had anyone actually try to explain to me what good goal setting looks like. Um, and I think it makes a lot of sense. I mean, I don't think that I, it made me look back on like goals that I had set for myself and beat myself up about not achieving and ask myself like, was it timely? Like, did I, did I respect like what a reasonable timeline to me succeeding in X was? Um, and I guess smart goals just for any uninitiated, uh, anyone not who hasn't been, you know, placed in the cult yet, a smart goal is it's an acronym. So it's, um, S is specific. M is measurable. A is achievable, R is realistic, which is also yeah, pretty so. much achievable. Um, and then T is timely. Um, that being said, like, as the thunder just booms in the background, um, <laughs> that being said, like, when you're, when you're working on a campaign for one of our clients, or when you're setting professional goals, like, is that a framework that you use? Um, I would say yes, but loosely. I don't think I follow it super strictly, but um, I mean, those are two of the kind of metrics in that SMART goals framework are part of our core values, which are results and improvement. So if you're not doing two of those things within a goal, then like, what are you doing? Right. Um, but when I do goals or what some clients will call like key performance indicators. So how do we know we're on the right track to achieve a certain goal? Um, yeah. So I guess we do kind of use smart goals when we're doing that. Um, and I'll usually have anywhere from three to five KPIs for a given plan, which usually spans anywhere from two to four quarters of a fiscal year. Um, so that's interesting actually that you brought that up because I guess we do kind of use an almost smart goals framework. So we want to see these things happen, tracking on a timeline. Those things are very specific. So they're important to the client. They're all different. And when I'm doing it, I'm thinking I can achieve them. You know, I'm not going to say something that I can't do within a certain time period. So, yeah, I guess we do kind of follow that for um, KPIs for clients. So good point, James. That goes back to my, hey, I, yeah, I use goals professionally because I have to. But personally, um, I really like that you brought up um, that you when you had set a goal for yourself and it wasn't following a smart goal framework or at least some kind of framework where you define a goal, have a timeline and have like a clear result that it's harder to complete or you're not as motivated to complete it. Um, I had the same goal after I graduated college. I wanted to write a book too. And I was between jobs. And have you heard of that? Like NaNoWriMo. So that's national November writers month. So for the month of November, this is like a thing. Everybody look it up. It's N-A-N-O-W-R-I-O -O or something like NaNoWriMo. And you're supposed to try to write a novel during the month of November. So you have 30 days. So it like gives you that really nice solid structure and framework to write a novel within 30 days. And you just start doing it. And so I thought I was going to do that. You know, I'm all like bright eyed and bushy tailed after I graduate college and yeah, like you, I think I got maybe 10 pages in and I was like, I can't do this. This is dumb. So, okay. Well, yeah. I got more than 10 pages in. I completed the first <laughs> draft, but I also didn't give myself 30 days. I gave myself nine months. Yeah. So, which speaking of realistic or achievable goals, um, I don't know what people's expectations are for the quality of their novel if they're producing it in 30 days. Um, but. <laughs> <laughs> who am I to judge, I guess, um, as, as someone who has never, who has never published anything, I am not one to judge. Um, but I mean, I think it makes sense that we would kind of, when we're goal setting with clients or when someone 
who needs to report on success goal sets with management. Like it makes sense that you would follow a kind of like, at least loosely, like the rules set out in smart goals, because smart is just a way to help you actually achieve them. Like, right. and it's a way to help you like categorize your achievement. I think what, what maybe is more telling about, um, you know, when, what happens when like a goal is failed, you know, is, you know, do I think it, it was a bad thing that I quit my jobs to write a book? No, I think it was a bad thing that I did that six months before COVID happened. And then I couldn't get a job when I, when I was ready to get back and get one. Um, that was a bad thing. Um, but like, you know, it, it's hard to go back and be like, oh, I do I regret that decision because I failed at the goal. So I think there's an amount that I worry that, you know, marketing can be trapped when it, when it runs only based on goals that even if you're using, even if you're doing everything you can to make the language with which you communicate success, um, you know, understood by all parties, um, you've got very clear lines in the sand. Um, you know, if what happens when you fail, but there's, but it still felt like a positive experience, like where you still were like, okay, I still think that we delivered value and we earned some amount of, you know, like we should be talking a little bit about how we did have some successes here. Like how, how do you navigate a situation where a goal was failed, but like an outcome was positive. I imagine that just happens frequently, especially maybe I, I want to say that that would be more likely when you worked in house. Um, but I could be wrong there yeah. as well. Yeah, that's actually a really interesting question. I love that you brought that up. And I think it goes back to like the whole purpose of why we do this podcast, right? It's like, you're always asking why, why am I doing this? Um, why is this important? Um, why are we chasing this tactic? And I think what it comes back to is trusting the strategy. So we have a very well-defined process. We believe in that process. We've seen it work multiple times. So I think when something fails in that process, it's really just maybe one piece of the greater framework or the greater process in general. So what I would do is like go back and analyze one piece of that puzzle. Were we using the right messaging? Was our positioning on point? Was something wrong during customer research? So I think that failure to your point, James, gives you so many more opportunities than when you're super successful. Because when you're super successful, it's like, okay, now I have to figure out how I'm going to scale this. How am I going to apply this process like two times over? But failure offers like almost more opportunities for you to go back and like redefine your own process. I don't know. What do you think? Yeah, I think, you know, I, th I think succeeding is obviously preferable to failing when it comes to goals. However, I kind of, I think what, what you said makes me think of is just how, I don't know, unhealthy it seems to me that like you would be in a position like where, okay, this is our goal. Um, let's say, you know, you're a marketing generalist at a company and your goal is they set, they give you a smart goal. They tell you, we want to increase conversion rate on our website by X percent in nine months. If failure to meet that goal doesn't involve like a, you know, a conversation about, okay, what did we do? What did we like? What did we not like? Where are we growing? Like, how are we then like what you really did was you had a temp position. <laughs> like if, if they're just like, well, you failed, get the hell out of here. Like you didn't have a full-time job. 
they just told you you did. Um, and, and it's like, that's just like, it's not a healthy way to work with people like in any capacity. Um, like no one is omniscient enough to say, okay, we're going to set a goal, especially like a long-term goal, like a nine month goal. Um, you know, we want at the end of Q3 X to be the case. Nobody knows even whether achieving that goal will actually be the highest priority thing that you have to do at that time. I mean, you, there's an amount that you have to be some amount of flexible. Um, you know, I, I feel like a person who has never let themselves be, you know, trapped by a goal I had set in terms of, you know, but I said I was going to do this. I must do it even against my best interests. Like, but, um, when you start setting, you know, when you start organizing all your work based on goals that you've set for, you know, two weeks, 30 days, 90 days, two quarters, I think you, you need some ability to have conversations about what the point of those goals were, whether there's another way to achieve, um, success without that goal, you know, presumably over the course of a year, an annual goal could become not that important. You know, a lot changes, especially in professional settings. Um, so I think there's an amount of flexibility that like really putting pressure on yourself about them isn't necessarily useful or healthy, but at the same time, I think like the goal, the purpose of the goal in my mind is to give you something to communicate your success with. Um, I think what's kind of interesting, and I don't know if you've worked in a, maybe a situation like what, like, I know you've worked in one of these situations, but maybe not in another. So in a situation where you are responsible, solely responsible for what happens, say you are the marketing team, like you're the person who they hired to do all of the marketing tasks, regardless of whether or not that's a reasonable ask, you're doing everything versus a situation in which let's say our content team didn't work on individual clients, but we all worked on every client. We all workshopped every single piece. We all did everything together. What happens in terms of like how you communicate success? Like how do I communicate success if everything that succeeds was worked on by like 19 people, you know, like goals are maybe one way that I can get around that. Um, but I'm curious kind of what, what your thoughts are and like, have you worked in a situation where you were like, well, I feel like my value is diminished by the fact that everything has to be touched by 85 people. Um, and it seems like a ploy to just keep me from understanding my true value. Yeah. So I've worked in like two different situations that you described. So in my corporate marketing job, for sure, not only were like marketing in the corporate position I was in, was not measured by anything. So we didn't even have goals. You know, it was just complete these activities that sales or product development teams give you. So you're just kind of a box checker on activities. Now, I did have another instance when I was in marketing for an R&D team. So naturally R&D, you're going to be they're going to be a little bit more lenient about failing. But I will say it's really interesting um, marketing in-house at industrial companies or maybe other companies where they're not as um, forward thinking about digital marketing, especially if you fail at a goal that you say you're going to complete and you come back and say, yeah, we failed, but I think it was because of X, Y, Z. And if we change it, we can try again. 
it's going to take a really unique leader to give you the opportunity to try that goal again. I was lucky that I had a leader like that who trusted me. And if we did fail at a specific tactic and I told him why I think we failed and how we could change next time, that he would have given me the opportunity to try again. But I know, I mean, we talk to folks twice a month in the industrial marketing community and they've told us like, if I fail at this, my industrial, like my leadership team will never give me an opportunity to prove marketing's value again. So to your point, I mean, there's really dangerous career and work situations where failure at a goal is just not an option. And I think to your point, James, for a goal to be successful, you do need a certain freedom to fail and a freedom to like reassess that goal and try again. Yeah, and that kind of makes me think of something that we talk about constantly, which is like, what are you like? What are you measured on? Is is it based on like, what is it based on software that you're running? Is it based on like attribution? Like, so like, let's say you have a goal that's the way that you've framed it with leadership is valuable. You know, it's valuable to have people surrendering their contact information to you that that has some amount of value it's um, valuable to you know have people reaching out for more information that's in a lot of situations that's a valuable marketing goal well what can i do to like manipulate the way that i get that information to meet that goal if I don't care about why we set the goal in the first place, like I can, I can do quite a lot. Um, I mean, I think it'd be a fun thought experiment to say like, okay, if you were tasked with something like gathering email addresses, full stop. Like if, if it yeah. was just generate email addresses via a click, like me as someone who, I guess like digital native is the buzz term. But me yeah. as someone who knows how to, who knows how the internet works, knows how people manipulate people on the internet and what works. If anything was on the table, I I would have a hundred percent confidence that I could hit almost any number, but that what I would think of would be totally like, totally horrible for the company. Like, you know, like there's ways to to really manipulate people and, and to do the wrong things and achieve a goal and not help and be very hurtful um, yeah. to your business. Like I, so there's, there's kind of micro versions of that situation that I hope, I hope people's jobs and people's trust with their employer don't rest on um, such small potatoes things as like, marketing qualified lead number. Um, but I imagine that there are instances in which that's the case because I have had a number of bosses at a number of different companies and I know <laughs> how that kind of thing works. Um, yeah. I wonder if, I mean, what's the, what's like the dumbest goal that you've been given by like somebody else? Cause that's the other thing is other people setting goals for you. Yeah. It's way different than you setting goals for your own success. So like, what's the, just the stupidest goal you've ever been given the most senseless. Let's see. I think I was given a goal. So, um, email marketing was really big at the company I worked for previously, especially when I was at the, on the corporate level and no, I'm not trying to like, you know, knock my former company in any way. They just didn't really know how email worked. And that's fine. You know, you don't know what you don't know. So my goal was to clean up the email list. And I made some suggestions. I did, you know, a week's worth of research on how domain email servers work. And this was, so this was like right in the middle of COVID, probably like a year after COVID hit and right. everyone in B2B was freaking out because all their messages are getting marked as spam, right? Right. Because they're sending 50 e-blasts a they're month sending spam. now. 
Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Because they're spending spam to their customers. So naturally, our company was one of the ones that got blocked. I did all this research and said, hey, we have to chop our email list. Like, I think we had like 15,000 people on our email list. And it was like, I said, we have to cut it to 8,000. Half of them are bouncing. The other half haven't opened an email in like two years. So that was my, my goal. That was the goal I was given. And nobody listened to me. Didn't, like, didn't even matter. To, like they had, you know, all of these objections for why we can't do that, why we shouldn't do it, why instead it should be the sales guy who should go and try to replace that contact's information with the company, you know, just all these excuses. And I could tell after I delivered that report and after I delivered the results that I found, that was always going to be the answer. So to your point, like the senselessness of the goal was that they didn't hear, they didn't want to hear it. They didn't want to hear the results I got. And they thought it was going to be some cool, you know, markety type hack that I had found to like right. go through these DNS servers and like make sure our email address or our email was getting through. And it's like, no, you just have to stop sending it. You have to A, stop sending junk and B, stop sending it to people who don't open your junk. And it was, yeah. So it's like clean up our email list without getting rid of any of the people that are yes. on it and the exactly. bots that are on it. Yeah. That's yeah, great. that's beautiful. <laughs> I I think that it's it's so funny how like you can have and I would have this is something that almost certainly is true regardless of whether you're agency, in-house, B2B, D to C, like no matter what you're doing, you could I mean when you're working in a restaurant, this is the case. A goal is given to you. And the person that gives you the goal does everything in their power to keep you from achieving it. Yes. And it's like, that's kind of when, um, when things just get a little comical, I mean, yeah. oh, improve, improve our conversion rate, but we don't want you to have access to our analytics. We don't want you to, um, you know, use hot jar. We don't like, we don't want to give you the tools that you need to do it. And we think like we're paying you X amount of money. So it, the, reaching this goal is, has X amount of value, but we won't spend like a 200th of that to like, give you this single tool that you need, uh, to succeed. And it's like, there's just nothing, there's just nothing stopping some people from misunderstanding what it takes yeah, to, just, to achieve just in marketing. You like the life of an industrial in-house marketer. Like that is exactly what happens. It's like, do this digital marketing thing with no budget and no resources. Okay, good luck. <laughs> right. Yeah, I, I kind of, I, I just wonder so much, like if you had to if every time that someone gave you like an objective, if they had to tell you, but I'm going to tell you all the things that you are not allowed to do. And I'm going to have to speak them out loud to you right now, rather than wait for you to be like, okay, so here's the plan. I'm going to need to talk to one of our, um, automotive customers, um, just one. And they're going to be like, oof. I don't know if the distribution network would be happy with you talking to one of our automotive customers. It's like, I am asking for you to do something for me that is going to take 15 minutes. Yes. 15 minutes. And you can't, you can't find me any evidence that it could possibly have a negative consequence. And yet here we are, the person who's, you know, making probably not enough money, but still, I would hope at least let's just go bare minimum, bare minimum. Like you're getting ripped off if you're making 40 K. And if they're paying you 40 K, they won't do this one thing that costs them no money that allows you to actually do your job. Yeah. The amount of times that things like that happen in every industry is totally baffling. Um, and would spark a whole, a whole nother discussion. Um, that's like what gets people thinking about like leadership from within 
and like workplaces owned by <laughs> um, the employees. I mean, gosh, that's all you need is a few of those experiences. And you're basically, you're waving red flags around everywhere. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if I have anything else. I mean, I think, I think moral of the story, goals can be super effective. They can be really helpful. I mean, being able to communicate success is valuable for you and your career. It's valuable for your company. Um, having a language, goals are a great language by which to communicate about those things. But by gosh, don't let them, don't let them be a troublesome thing. I mean, yeah. it's hard enough achieving results as it is, you know, goals getting in the way of that is just a whole separate problem. I don't know if you have any kind of final thoughts. Yeah, I would say number one thing about goals, especially professionally in your marketing coordinator, manager, specialist job, make sure if a company is asking you to set goals that they're going to give you the resources you need to succeed and the freedom to fail in one area of the process so that you can reassess and try again. And that is super reasonable to ask for, by the way. Yeah. So like if anyone is, is, you know, thinking, oh gosh, like I just want this job so bad. You know, I, I just want to get in there and, you know, I don't care how miserable it ends up, you know, ends up being like, it's, this seems like a trap, but I just have to do it. Like, it's not unreasonable to ask, you know, to ask those kind of types of questions and request those types of things from the outset in the interview, in the third interview, you know, like that's, that's honestly like the people that are super, the most successful, the person that's actually making the money at your company does that. Yes. When, when they have conversations, um, there there's, I, I, I feel like I, that was something that I learned too late, um, in my career and too, like too late. And here, here I'm saying that, and I'm like 28 <laughs> years old, but, um, I, I wish I would have known, you know, just how normal and professional it is to make those types of requests and have those types of conversations. So that's a great value add. Um, yeah. but yeah, well, thanks a bunch for listening. Um, if you enjoyed it more than any other episode, be sure to DM Aaron weeks, um, on LinkedIn and let him know that he's holding the podcast back. Um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, we'll be back with Aaron next week. Thanks a bunch, y'all. Thanks Keep for listening, asking guys. the why, I think uh, Aaron would want me to say. But uh, yeah, peace. Mm -hmm.